All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. Father, thank you so much for this tremendous privilege and honor to address your people. Dear God, I pray that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is going to say today. And I pray, God, that you would move upon our hearts, soften our hearts, give us a heart to want to, uh, Lord, receive your word. Give us a will to want to obey. Thank you for your precious people. Thank you for your spirit that's going to teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 12, looking at verses 1 and 2. The title of this message is Conformed or Transformed. Conformed or Transformed. All of us, by the things we say, the places we go, the things we look at, all of us every single day are either being conformed to this world or we're being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. How do you know what's happening with you? I, I believe that these verses are going to let us know, it's going to tell us how we can know whether we're being conformed to this world or we're being transformed into the image of Christ. Let's dive in because I had to cut out and take out some stuff and time is limited and running, getting away from me. Look at it. It's just ticking away. Tick, tick, tick. Okay. <laughs> Look what it says there in verse one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, before I get started, you, if you remember from last time, I had the shirt, uh, ask me the Greek word. Because the New Testament was written in Greek and I bring out different Greek words, not to try to impress you. I've been in ministry almost 40 years now, so I'm done trying to impress people. Uh, but then also to give you just to expand your understanding on a verse because the English language is somewhat limited. We have one word for love and the Greeks have five because there are different types of love as we all know. So I will bring out different Greek words to expand your understanding of the verse and you're going to see that throughout uh, this particular um, you know, set of verses. Notice I want to draw your attention to the first part of verse one, I beseech you. The word beseech, the Greek word is parakaleo, and it's an amazing Greek word. It means to come alongside to help. It's a great word because Jesus used the noun form of this word in John 14 and verse 16 to describe the Holy Spirit, the parakletos. Meaning that the Holy Spirit, Jesus was telling his disciples, will come alongside of you after I'm gone and help you along the way. In extra biblical material, uh, the uh, parakaleo, that particular word was used to describe a commanding officer encouraging his troops before they went out to battle. And so here's Paul saying, I am your spiritual commanding officer encouraging you to get out and fight the battle that you're gonna face as believers. So today, I'm your spiritual commanding officer. I'm going to encourage you because the word parakaleo uh, is a word that means to urge, to command, to admonish. And, and, and I'm going to admonish you. I'm going to come alongside of you to urge you, to admonish you to get out there and continue to fight. This church is in the midst of some tremendous battles. Some tremendous battles, and you guys are doing a tremendous work out there. And so I'm going to urge you to keep it going because we have three enemies as believers, the world, the flesh, and the devil. I just want to encourage you. I didn't mention this first service. I want to encourage you this, to remember this. Keep in mind, because we can lose sight. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 12. But against principalities, power, spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. The principalities of power, those are various rankings of uh, demonic spirits. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I wanted to say that slower. Stop looking at the flesh and blood. 
Stop looking at the individual person. You remember Jesus. Jesus taught us how to do this. I got to go to the cross, he told his disciples. Peter spoke up, far be it from you, Lord. You ain't going to that cross. And Jesus said, get behind me, who? Satan. For you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus saw behind what was working in Peter's life and saw the demonic spirit using Peter's mouth. Don't look at the flesh and blood in office. Don't look at the flesh and blood in the White House. Don't look at the flesh and blood with the school board. You're not fighting them. So if we're fighting a spiritual being or spiritual entities, then we need to fight them the way that God told us, tells us to. You got to fight it spiritually behind the scenes. So before your ballots and all this sort of stuff, you praying, oh God, you're coming against. And I just wanted to remind you that as your spiritual commanding officer for the day, <laughs> I wanted to remind you of that. So notice what he says there. I beseech you therefore, brethren. Ah, he lets us know who he's talking to. He's talking to believers. He says, what I'm about to urge, what I'm about to beseech you to do, unbelievers can't do. And to confirm that he's talking to believers, notice he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. We receive the mercies of God at salvation. Titus 3, 5 says, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So he's talking to believers. Unbelievers can't do what he's about to urge, what he's about to beseech them to do. Notice, what is it that you urging and beseeching by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice? Present our bodies. What he is saying is that our bodies, our humanness that cooperates with sin, our bodies can get in the way of us presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice on the altar of God. Our bodies can. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, here's the thing. Paul paints a, a graphic picture on how we need to place our bodies on the altar as a living sacrifice. Hey, for you note takers, I want you to look at Romans chapter three and verses 13 through 18. Listen to how Paul paints a graphic picture of our bodies, our humanness, and how they need to be placed on the altar. Listen to what he says. He said, their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, do you see why we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice? I want you to know, let's go a little bit deeper, just by asking ourselves this question. Has your throat been an open tomb? Every time you open your mouth, you're speaking words that's just killing those around you. Words that are killing the spirit of your wife. The words that's killing the ingenuity and the get up and go to, to your husband. It's killing your kids. Why can't you be like, and why are you doing that? You're nothing like. I wonder, have your throat been an open tomb speaking that which is dead to those around you? Or have your tongue practiced deceit? Lies, half-truths, exaggerations. I have a family member, young family member, that's already have um, crafted lies to an incredible degree. Lies, parents, grandparents, you need to really deal with lying if your children or grandchildren are, are practicing that. Now, we know Psalm 58 verse 3 said they come out of the womb speaking lies. They're not these little bundles of joy like you think. They're little liars. Is what they are. 
oh, look at you, you know, y'all Google fit. No, they're liars. And they're little manipulators too. They're charmers, like Psalm 58 verse three goes on to say, they're little charmers. They know how to charm you to pick them up, to feed them and all that sort of stuff. You know, my grandchildren are incredible charmers. We've got little twins that be a, a, a year old next month and they're just charmers. They just wail and cry and manipulate and just, and just get old pop pop here, and just get, get me going. So if they're practicing lying, because see, John 8, 44 said that God, uh, that Satan is the father of lies. So that is something you need to root out. So whether the poison of apps has been under your lips, that is something else you got to wonder. Poisoning children against your ex. Poisoning the people on the job against the leader of the job. Poisoning folks at church. Come on, let's leave and go somewhere else. And you got a whole crew that, and you sit at the next church, you know, look at us. And you done poisoned those people. Poisoning family members against others. I I just wonder whether the poison of apps has been under your lips. Whether your mouth has been full of cursing and bitterness. This is amazes me. I, I, I say this around the country wherever I go and speak. I'm always amazed at those who call themselves believers and they use profanity. I'm always shocked at that. I mean, we're talking about profanity. And oh, you know, ain't no wrong with a little profanity. You know, I'm just, you know, excuse my French. That's not French. That's English and bad English. Don't come up with that, it's French. Wee oui, wee. Oui. I know you weren't saying wee oui, wee. Oui. So I'm, I'm amazed at that. Why? Because Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Meaning that the tongue goes down into the well of the heart and brings up what is there. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.17, it said that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So if Christ is in our hearts, then that means the tongue will go down into the well of the heart and now bring up that which is Christ-like. My (coughs) girlfriend used to say when we were teenagers, now she's my wife of 36, almost 37 years, you know, so... When, when we were teenagers, so that means we've been, um, been together a total of 41 years and been married over 36 of the 41. Now, here's the thing. She saw me when I was a little punk teenager with an afro, you know, just thought, I mean, yeah. So when we were teenagers, you know, I had the, I had the most filthy mouth. She used to always say, you got such a filthy mouth. And, yeah, I mean, this is what I heard at home. So, you know. And I went into the Marine Corps, I, 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 you know, I was just fitting right in. Curse like a sailor? Oh, no, I embarrassed some sailors. <laughs> but when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, August 26, 1985, the first place the Lord cleaned up was this, was my mouth. Because if Christ dwells in my heart through faith, then the tongue will go down into the well of the heart and bring up what is there. This is why the first place anyone should know that you're a Christian is to hear you speak, to hear you talk. And I remember when, when, when the curse word used to slip out, I was, like, I was horrified. So this is why I, I just have a problem with those who call themselves Christians and then you know, they come and sing these beautiful songs. Lord, we, you know, we love you, Lord. And then get out in the car and string a set of curse words. James said in James chapter three, he says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. He said, these things are not to be. So this is why some of you need to put your mouth on the altar. But notice it not only says mouthful of cursing, but it says of bitterness. 
You know what bitterness is? Bitterness is when the sun has gone down on your anger. Ephesians 4.26 says, be ye angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because as soon as you feel that emotion of anger, the clock is ticking. When you allow the sun to go down on your anger, this is why I tell couples never go to bed angry. When you allow the sun to go down on your anger, then verse 27 kicks in. Verse 26, be ye angry, sin not, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Verse 27, nor give place to the devil. When we allow the sun to go down on our anger, we give place for the devil to come and bring his friend. His friend is bitterness. And if we don't deal with that bitterness, he brings another friend. It's called hatred. And then the climax of it all is murder. That's the progression. Anger, bitterness, hatred, then murder. Oh, you may not pull the trigger, but you'll definitely pull the trigger in your heart. This is why Jesus said anger is at the root of murder in Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22. So, mouth full of, notice, cursing and bitterness. Or oh, whether your feet have been swift to shed blood. Where have your feet been taking you lately? Over someone's house that you shouldn't be? Where's your, where have your feet been taking you? And finally, whether there is the fear of God before your eyes. You know, David said in Psalm 101 verse 3 and Psalm 119 verse 37, he said, I will set nothing worthless or wicked before my eyes. Whenever we set something worthless or wicked before our eyes, it's a major problem. It shows that we don't have the fear of God. He said, I will set nothing worthless. And then he says, nor wicked. I am shocked on how believers can find tremendous entertainment in horror movies. I'm shocked at that. When the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. If God didn't give us a spirit of fear, then who did? And if, if the other guy did, Amen. then why am I partaking of that? I, oh, somebody need to hear that. I didn't even say that first service. Somebody need to hear that. You're a horror movie watcher, aren't you? You love this time of the year. Just horror movies. Just, you into it. The Jason 200. <laughs> you know. And about 200 of those Jasons, you know. And you all into it, you know. You know. So, this is what he is saying here. So, which part of your body you need to place upon the altar? Is it your mouth? Is it your tongue? Is it what you set before your eyes? Is it your feet? Now do you see why we need to place our bodies, present our bodies as a living sacrifice? Notice he said living sacrifice. A dead sacrifice just stays there. You know anything about the Old Testament, those Old Testament sacrifices, they would kill those animals, the animals was laying there, ready to be barbecued. But a living sacrifice can get on and off the altar. So it's some, that's why it says present yourself. It's something you willingly do. We got two examples of a living sacrifice. We got number one, we have Isaac. Isaac in the Old Testament, you remember Abraham taking Isaac on top of Mount Moriah? Go off him as a sacrifice, God told him to. And all of a sudden, we think that there's this old man, Abraham and his little boy, Little boy Isaac, God told him to sacrifice this little bitty boy. Oh, how could God do that? God's so mean. Isaac was approximately 33 years old. Isaac is a picture or a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus was 33 when he went on the cross, and Isaac was approximately 33 in order for him to be a type. Meaning that he could have took that old man who was about 100, 100 years old, could have put, put, mm, mm. Boom! I ain't getting up on that altar. He could have. But he willingly got up there. And right when he's about to, God said, ah, don't you dare. Now I know you fear me. And we know the ultimate living sacrifice is Jesus himself. He said, no man take my life, but I lay it down. He freely laid it down. He freely laid it down for you and laid it down for me. 
Many people say, oh, those Romans, they killed my Jesus or the Jews killed my Jesus. No, your sin and my sin put Jesus on the cross. That's who put Jesus to death, our sin. No human did that. He said, no man take my life. He said, don't you know I can call 12 legions of angels to, to take care of me? A legion is around 6,000 soldiers, 12 times 6,000. You mathematicians, y'all already figured it all, all out. <laughs> and just keep in mind, whatever that number is, on one night, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. In one night, one angel. So can you imagine 12 times 6,000? you mathematicians, 12 times 6,000, they kill everybody in the world. So Jesus said, no man take my life, I lay it down. So he laid it down for us. And, and notice he says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your body the living sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice is acceptable to God? One that is holy. You see that there? The Greek word is hagias. Hagias, it means to be set apart for uh, a particular purpose. It's set apart for God's use. And, and notice that that is the sacrifice that is acceptable to God. Notice which is your reasonable service. Uh, the Greek word for reasonable is logikos. It's where we get, a, get our English word logic or logical or that which belongs to reason. And Paul is saying in light of all that God has done for us in chapters 1 through 11, it is only logical and reasonable that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. You see the word service there? The Greek word is letraia, and it means service of any kind. However, letraia was used in the Old Testament to speak of worshiping God according to the prescribed Le Levitical ceremonies. In other words, the priestly service was a part of Old Testament worship. So this says to us that we need to live a lifestyle of worship. Worship is not a certain genre of music. Worship is not just the, the, the few little songs they sing, you know, before I get to church, I can come late because as long as I'm there for that word, that's all that, that matters. I'm there for that word. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That word is great, yes. But the worship prepares our heart for the word. This is why wherever we go, people are amazed. My wife and I, we speak around the country and they're always amazed at we want to be in there when worship just start. Oh, no, we, we're in the front seat. You're in the front row. You know, we're ready because it prepares our hearts. You have to understand the Bible says God is light. In him is no darkness at all, 1 John 1, 5. So God is light. So during worship, we are exposing ourselves to the God that is light, and he is pointing out all of those dark areas in our life that we need to confess to him as sin. And we're exposing ourselves before the God who is light, who sees. The Bible says light and darkness are the same to God. He sees it all, and he's pointing out attitudes and tempers and, and how you said that to this person and it wasn't right and you treated your wife wrong in, even in the parking lot of the church. And he's pointing all that out. He's pointing it all out, preparing us, preparing us for the word. This is what worship does. We're talking to God through worship. And then he speaks to us through the word. So we've already prepared ourselves. Watch this. It says, which is your reasonable act of worship. The word worship, the Greek word is proskuneo. It means to turn and to kiss and to adore. You've seen in other cultures and stuff how they will bow down and take the hand and, and kiss the hand and that sort of thing. That's what worship, they're worshiping that person. They, they would just say, well, I'm just showing a little adoration. No, you're worshiping them because that's what worship means. It means to turn and to kiss and to adore. And as we are, as we are worshiping God, we're turning our attention to him and we're adoring him and, and kissing him and saying, thank you for waking me up to see a new day. Thank you for blood in my, running through my veins. Thank you for the air in my lungs. Thank you for another day praying me through the night. And we're adoring him. 
Then when the word comes, ah, we can receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. But if you miss out on that and you come late and you come in as long as you're there for that word, then this is what happens. When you hear something in the word you don't like, I'm not doing that. That's his opinion. That's his interpretation. That's, a, that's one a lot of people like to use. Here we, we spend our life and spend decades studying this Bible. And that's our job to study this Bible, to have somebody come and say, that's your interpretation. Are you kidding me? I forgot more than you ever learned about this book. <laughs> It's like me going to your job and looking at you do your job. Oh, well, that's your interpretation on how to do that job. He'd be like, dude, I've been doing this for 20, 30 years. Get out of here. That's what, what pastors want to say to some of y'all. Get out of here. <laughs> because I'm running out of time, let me jump to... Let me jump to verse 2. Look at the, uh, the conjunction and that starts verse 2. It's a conjunction that connects two things together, meaning that what is said in verse one and verse two are connected. They're not disconnected from one another, they're connected. Notice it says, and, first we said, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And while you're at it, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to draw your attention to the word conformed. The Greek word is a mouthful, but you, when, once you hear it, you'll understand it. The Greek word is suskitmatizo. It's where we get our English word schematic from, schema. It means to follow a prescribed uh, method and pattern. Just like many of you who are into construction, you get the blueprints. You get the schematics of the, how the building is supposed to be, where the light switches go and the receptacles and all this sort of stuff. And, and, and that you understand it's a pattern that you follow. And so too it says, be not conformed to this world. It was used of masquerading or putting on an act specifically by following a prescribed pattern or scheme. Schema, the, the Greek word. And like I said, it's where we got schematic from. This verb is passive and it describes something we are allowing to be done to us. The word not and be not conform is negative and Paul is given a command for us to not allow ourselves to be conformed to this world. In other words, we're not to masquerade as a person of this world or as J.B. Uh, Phillips trans, uh, paraphrases it, don't let the world around you squeeze you into his mold. In other words, we are not to pattern ourselves after this present evil age. Now, notice he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. The but, the conjunction shows that he is contrasting what he just said. He said, don't be conformed to this world, but there's something you ought to do. I'm about to contrast, but be transformed. The word transform is, the Greek word is metamorpho. It's where we get our English word metamorphosis, that process that the caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly. Matthew uses this word metamorpho in uh, Matthew 17 verse 2 to describe the transformation uh, of Jesus when the, Jesus was transformed on the Mount of Transfiguration, showing that it, it means that Jesus' deity was shining forth through his humanity. Paul used this <coughs> also in 2 Corinthians 3.18 where he says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed, metamorpho, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of God. We are to be transformed. Now watch this. I believe that there are many believers that need to experience a spiritual metamorpho, a spiritual metamorphosis, where the Jesus you said is in you 
is shining forth through your humanity that when people see you, they don't see you, they see Jesus. This is what I believe. You, a lot of people claim, Jesus is in my heart, yes. But can the people around you see that? What about your wife? What about your husband? What about your children? What about your neighbors? Do they know that you, that Jesus is on the inside of you? And I, see, this is why I think that there are many believers need to experience a spiritual metamorphosis. The Jesus you claim is in there. Need, people, people don't need to see you. They need to see Jesus. They don't need to see me. They need to see Jesus. You remember one time in John chapter 12, they said, they went up to, I think it was Philip. They said, we wish to see Jesus. You know what? That's what the world is constantly saying to the church. Big C church. We wish to see Jesus. We see everything else, but can we see Jesus from y'all? Just a thought. And I believe that's what the world is asking. Can they see Jesus? So, Notice it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the way that we are transformed is by having our minds renewed. Our minds are renewed through the word of God, through the teaching of the word of God. And your pastor is teaching you from Genesis to Revelation, teaching you the word of God. His sons are teaching your high schoolers and your young adults through the word of God. They're giving you, so every time we expose ourselves to the word of God, either in our personal reading or as you come to church on Sundays and Wednesday, your mind is being renewed. And our minds need to be re renewed because it's constantly out in the world. And just think, just think, you may be in here for an hour on Sunday, maybe an hour for Wednesday. The rest of the time you're in the world. I just pray you're not of the world. And I pray you're not being squeezed into its mold. So as I'm almost out of time, here's the thing. Let me, let me begin to finish that, that verse up. It says, uh, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. You see that word prove there? Uh, Dokimos is the Greek word there. And, and it's an amazing Greek word. It's a word that proves by testing is what it means, dokimos. It means when metals are proved or tested to see the strength and weakness of it. So as we saturate ourselves in the word of God and saturate through your own personal reading and then here on Sundays and Wednesdays, as you saturate yourself in the word of God, your mind is being renewed. And then that means you will filter everything in life through the word. And that way you would know God's perfect and acceptable will for your life. Many people want to know what is God's will for my life? Is that as you saturate yourself in the word, because see God's will is revealed in his word as it's being taught on Sundays and Wednesdays at your own personal reading, you're renewing your mind and you're filtering everything through the word of God. Let me conclude with this. Conformed or transform? What is happening to you? Are you allowing the world to squeeze you into its mold? When you look at, I was sitting over there doing worship and the Lord reminded me of something. And I was just, I said, no, I've never said that before. As you look at yourself in the spiritual mirror, what do you see reflecting back? A person that looks, acts, talks, walks like the world? Or a person that's being conformed, you, you see little glimpses of Jesus in, in, in that mirror. Are you being conformed or transformed? Only you can answer that question. And so as you take time to saturate yourself through the word of God, your mind is gonna be renewed and you're gonna be knowing what is God good and acceptable and perfect will for your life. Father, we do thank you. Thank you for this time you've given us. Lord, thank you for your precious people. And Lord, there are some people here that needs to place certain body parts onto the altar. Lord, I just pray, Lord, continue to cause us to present our entire bodies as a living sacrifice. Forgive us, Lord, for not having the fear of God before our eyes. Forgive us for putting worthless and wicked things before our eyes. And dear God, I just pray. I pray 
your blessings upon us. We need you, Lord. We fall short. And so, God, I pray that you help us to walk in your ways, to follow your will. Lord, there's some that need to come back to you. They, they've drifted. They need to come back. They've been squeezed into the mold of this world. Oh, God, I pray that you move in their lives, move in their hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.